Welcome to our Thanksgiving service. So glad you're here tonight with us. Yes, we're glad y'all are here. Uh, I'm going to give you an update on our food drive. Currently, James got 15 uh, canned goods Sunday, and that brings him to a that brings him to a total of 192. Uh, I got 47 canned goods Sunday. Yay! And that brings me to 201, so I'm barely in the lead, but I am in the lead. So remember, this is our last Sunday. Bring your canned goods, uh, your food items, and because uh, we're going to do a final count, and then one of us will get a pie in our face. So make sure you're here Sunday for that. We gather together. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens His will to make known. The wicked oppressing now cease from distressing. Sing praises to His name, He forgets not His own. Be beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining His kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the we were winning, the Lord was at our side, oh glory be thine. We all do extol thee, thou leader triumphant, and pray that thou still a defender will be. Let thy congregation escape tribulation, thy name be ever praised, O Lord, make us free. We call to exalt thee, thou leader triumphant, and pray that thou Escape tribulation, thy name be ever praised, O Lord, make us free. We are so blessed. We are so Take 
take what we have to bring take it all everything lord we love you so much Amen and amen and amen. We want to just, <coughs> excuse me, praise God for all his blessings and thank you, Jeff and worship team for leading us. And uh, we're glad and we're honored that you are worshiping with us tonight. Uh, now this is recorded. This is not live. And so, but um, we're doing this on Monday. That way uh, we can spend time with our families uh, for Thanksgiving. And so, um, Thank you for all the choices that you have that you could have watched. Uh, you chose to tune in and worship with us tonight. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 103. Uh, Psalm 103, for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at this thought in Psalm 103 um, about reasons to give thanks. Reasons to give thanks. And I want to share uh, three reasons out of Psalm 103 why we need to give thanks on this Thanksgiving Eve tonight okay 
Let's read Psalm 103, verses 1 through 6. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and in all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Now, I kind of like the King James and the New King James. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Verse 2, praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your diseases and heals all, I'm sorry, forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Amen. God, we ask that you bless the reading and the preaching and the proclaiming of your word. May I explain it in a way that brings you glory and honor, and may we be transformed into more and more thankful people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when David wrote this, David was probably close to the end of his lifetime. He's probably in his later years and he's reflecting back upon the goodness of God and how God has worked in his life. He begins with praising God. He says, I'm going to praise God with my whole heart. In fact, when he says, praise the Lord, he means you yourself praise the God. So he says, I myself am praising God. I'm going to lift up my voices. Nobody's going to offer the praise for me. I am going to do it myself. And so he begins praising God with his whole heart and he pra his praise is focused on the goodness and the mercy of the living God. If you notice the way the Lord is spelled here, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is the name Yahweh or Jehovah in the Hebrew. That means God is always with me. He never leaves me alone because he never wants me to be alone. And so he is praising the ever-present, ever-living God who is always with him. Now listen, David understood some things that you and I need to understand. And, and he understood this, that when it comes to the day that uh, the, the day that the Lord has made, we have a couple of choices. He says, I'm going to rejoice in it, and we, we can either rejoice or we can grumble and complain in it. And so in this Psalms, he says, I'm going to rejoice in it instead of complaining because of what God has done for me. We need to get to the point in our faith walk that, that no matter how difficult life may become, and life can become difficult then we should do what the hymn writer encourages us to do. Count your blessings. Name them one by one by one by one by one and then it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And so David mentions three things in here that we need to be praising God for. In verses 3, 4, and 5 uh, he mentions three things. The first one is this in verse 3. Notice what he says. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. And so the first thing we need to praise God for is for God's forgiveness forgiveness for God's forgiveness in the New Testament when somebody came to Jesus for healing and Jesus was working in and, and, and healing people uh, most of the time that when you read when it talks about him healing he would say your sins are forgiven now be healed because healing and and, and forgiving went close together and so uh, let me ask you this question here how many sins does God forgive well look what it says he forgives part of my sin all of them, amen, all of them. He forgives all of our sin, not just the ones we think are so bad. He forgives all of our sin. Now, when you and I made a personal conscious decision to surrender our life to God because we, to God because we confessed our sins and we surrendered ourselves to him and said, Jesus, I am a sinner. God, forgive me. I am a sinner. Um, when we made a personal conscious decision to follow Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, God forgave, listen, God forgave all of your sin. He forgave all of your past sin from that, from, May 19, 1979, when I came to know Jesus Christ, all the sins that I've committed up to that day, he forgave. All the sins I was committing in that moment, uh, around that time, or in that day, uh, he forgave. Everything after that, he forgave. In other words, he's not going to hold anything against me. He's not going to take away my salvation. However, there is something that we need to be mindful of. Any sin that we commit the day after, any sin that we commit after the day of salvation... Even though God will not uh, 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 punish us for that, we will still stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ to give an accounting for that sin. And that's the sin that we commit. Every sin that I've committed after May 19, 1979, I've got to stand before Jesus Christ and account for that. Romans chapter 14, verse 12 says, We as Christians, we will give an accounting of ourselves to Christ Jesus. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, We must all stand before Christ to be judged or to be accounted for. And we will receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil that we have done in this earthly body. And that's for sins that you've committed as a Christian. If you are not a Christian, you will not stand before the judgment seat of Christ. You would only stand before the judgment seat of God, the Father. That's the great white throne judgment. And at the great white throne judgment, God would either say, uh, yes, your name is written in the book of life. Now come on in. And then you're going to have to go stand before Jesus and count for the sin that you committed as a Christian. Okay. If your name is not in the book of, in the book of life, God will lovingly say to you, even though it's going to break his heart to say this, depart from me. I never knew you because your name's not in the book. Okay. And so, um, so we need to be mindful of God's forgiveness. In verse 10 through 14, David continues writing along this theme. And notice what he says. God does not treat us as our sins deserve. What does our sin deserve? Jesus took every beating and every punishment, poured out the wrath of God. Was, the wrath of God was poured out upon him. He, 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 he was treated for us. He, he became our sin so that we can become righteous. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Praise God for that. Or repay us according to our iniquities. Good gosh, if God repaid us for our iniquities, none of us would be able to stand before, uh, before him. He goes on and says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, hallelujah, so great is his love for those who fear him. That word fear uh, means that you are holding God in reverence and honor and all and, and that you are worshiping him above all gods. And as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. How high is the heavens above the earth? We don't know. It's boundless, okay? He goes on in verse 12. He says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. See, east and west never meet. And this is just a symbolic way of saying that God's forgiveness is bountiful and never ending. It is for ongoing forever and forever because east and west would never meet. He goes on in the, verse 13 and 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who, listen to says, on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. And he remembers that we are dust. In verses 13 and 14, when God examines you and and me, he remembers that we, listen, he remembers that you and I are not God. We are made in the image of God, but we are not God. And he remembers that. He, he remembers what the, what the scripture says, that we are prone to follow every temptation of our heart. He, he, he remembers that we seek to fulfill every evil thought that comes into our heart. That, listen, that should never be an excuse for our sinfulness that, that, that where, where Jeremiah said, he said, the heart is wicked above all things. And, and God says people are chased after the desires of their heart all the time. That should never be an excuse for your sin. If you are a Christian, you have been set free from that wickedness and that sinfulness in your heart. And you need to be walking with God. See, God will deal with us with his compassion and and in his mercy. And he will not do it to, to excuse your sin. But to deliver you from your sin. Just this morning. Uh, this is Monday. And this morning. Um, in my uh, daily appointment with God that I have. Every morning. Uh, part of what I do. I, I, I've been reading through Surgeon, Charles Spurgeon's sermons. And now I've got four volumes. I've just basically, I've just recently finished, I'm finishing up volume one now. Uh, he's got a lot of stuff in there. Okay. And, um, and, and so this morning I read this. Charles Spurgeon said this. A man may renounce every outward sin and yet not really repent. We can clean up what we, if we want to. We can act right and decent. We can even act holy. But if we don't repent, then we're not righteous. And so God will deal with us in his mercy and his compassion, not to excuse our sin, but because he wants to deliver us from our sin. Now, David says, I rejoice because he forgives my sin and he heals my diseases. Listen, forgiveness, forgiveness is like anybody, you ever been sick? And you know you're sick and you're going down, but then you start getting the antibiotics in you and getting fluids in you and you're getting well. And all of a sudden you feel, wow, this is great. I haven't felt this great in a long time. That's what forgiveness is like to the soul. It's just like being healed when you're sick. Have you ever been burdened with something? It's just your heart's just, 
you just feel like you're weighted down with something and all of a sudden someone or God or somebody comes along that helps you and, and lifts that burden off of you and you're going, wow, I, I can't believe this is so good. That's what forgiveness of sin is like. Anybody ever had a run in with a with a friend and and you were just you were just spatting and spitting at each other and maybe it was a family maybe it's a friend or somebody and you've had rec you've had you've had problems with them and, and you and you was burdened for that but you 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 step forward or they step forward or somebody stepped forward and there was reconciliation made where you was then um you was then you was then brought back together and you restored that friendship and and there was rejoicing there that's what forgiveness is like. See, and all this comes in your life, my life, because when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he removed the wall of hostility. He removed our sin so that we can be made right with God. That's why we need to be celebrating Jesus' uh, death on the cross, but we need to celebrate God's forgiveness. The second thing he says we need to, we need to celebrate, and he blesses the Lord for us, found in verse 4, who redeems your life from the pit. And crowns you with love and compassion. We need to be praising God for God's redemption. Not only God's forgiveness, but God's redemption. He goes in verses 6 through 9. And notice what he says. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. In other words, there is no one outside of God's reach. He works righteousness for all the oppressed. And, and when, when the devil is attacking us, we're all oppressed. And he works righteousness. He offers you salvation. He offers me salvation. He offers us justice so that we can be set free. And, and, and see, God, God doesn't choose some people for redemption. He chooses all people for redemption. He wants everyone to be saved. First Peter, I'm sorry, Second Peter chapter 3 verse uh, 9 says um, that God has given you time to repent because he does not want anyone to die apart from salvation. And so he wants all people to be saved. John 3, 16, he, it says God so loved what? The world, that word, the world, means all of the world. Not just these people or those people, but everybody. He loves everyone. And so he, he works justice and righteousness for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. And as God was leading his people of Israel out of bondage and they were in the desert and they were going toward the promised land, God revealed himself to Moses so that Moses would proclaim the goodness of God to the people. And then the people saw the mighty works of God. And, and he was saying, because we've seen God's work, we need to praise him as well. He goes on and says, the Lord is compassionate and he's gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. And the people of Israel saw that. He will not always accuse us, nor or will he harbor his anger forever? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for that. Because see, Moses saw that. The people of Israel saw that. We have seen that. And we need to be celebrating and praising God because of that. See, when God redeemed the nation of Israel from bondage and from, from all the difficulties they had in their journey going from Egypt all the way over to the promised land, he, 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 he loved on them. He worked among them. And he would do the same thing for you through Jesus Christ. Because he frees us from our sin so that Jesus Christ will be our master and will care for us forever. And when he puts that crown upon our head, we have been transformed from a slave into a king. Or if you're a girl, a queen. He saves you and redeems you and he makes you Royalty, because he says you are a royal priesthood. You are royal people. And so we need to be praising God with all of our being, first of all, because why? Because of God's forgiveness. Now we need to be praising him because of his redemption. Then he says in verse 5, and he satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We need to be praising God because of God's satisfaction. God's satisfaction. In fact, he goes in verse 15 through 18 and he helps us to understand what he is talking about. And gives us a little insight into his mind as he writes, as for man and woman, his or her days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower 
of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, but its place remembers it no more. What's that talking about? Just the brevity of life. Just the brevity of life. We will be here just for a second in, in the time of, of eternity. But God is here from the beginning all the way to the end and beyond. If there's such an end of time. We are like, we are like the grass of the field. We are like the flower of the field that, that fades away. The wind will blow over. We're gone. And, and, and we're, you know, most of us want to leave a legacy that people remember us. But the truth is, after some time, most of us are going to be forgotten about. People won't remember our name. In fact, after you die, can I give you a little insight real quick? After you die, somebody's already planning what they're going to come get of your stuff. And they're going to take it home. And not only are they going to be planning what, they, what they're going to get of your stuff to take it to their house and be theirs, they also already planning and thinking about the stuff that, that nobody wants and they're going, to, they're going to get rid of it. When you die, if you're still working, uh, the day after you die, well, they might wait till after your funeral, but most of the time the day after you die because you're not coming in anymore, uh, they're already posting your job up on the job sites. We need somebody to fill Bubba's place. Wow. Not that they don't love you. They're not remembering you no more. Okay. Morbid thought, I know. But we need to praise God that we're not here forever in this world because we are destined for the next world, okay? And so this world, uh, the old song used to say, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. Praise God for that, right? Uh, praise God that none of this stuff that we see right now is temporary. None of it is, none of it is our home. We have a home uh, over in glory land, so to speak, okay? And so he's saying, that's what he's talking about there. In verse 17 and 18, he says, but everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts see God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom it's not just a moment in time but it's throughout all of ages God is the eternal God he is the eternal king he is the everlasting one he is the one uh, who, who has always been there and will always be there and he has always committed himself to his people throughout all the generations He's not going to stop with this generation. The next generation coming along, he's going to commit himself to them and raise them up too. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, uh, Moses uh, takes the Ten Commandments back down uh, the mountain to the people. And, and, and one of the Ten Commandments says this, honor your father and your mother. And it has a promise so that if you would honor your father and the mother, you will live long in the land that the Lord has given you. Exodus 34, I love this. Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 through 7. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with Moses and he called out his own name. I am Yahweh. I am Jehovah. And then the Lord passed in front of Moses calling out. I am Yahweh. I am Jehovah. The Lord. The God of compassion and the God of mercy. I am slow to anger and I am filled with unfailing love and, and kindness. I lavish unfailing love uh, to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity. I forgive rebellion. I forgive sin. But I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and the grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. Why is it, why is it repeated? Because someone says, I'm not going to break that cycle, but you can break the cycle. God, forgive me for my sin. I want the goodness of God. I don't want the badness of man. And when God satisfies you with the goodness of the kingdom, why would you desire to go back to the old ways? Man is frail and temporary. We're just here for a moment. But we can enjoy eternal youthfulness, so to speak. And that's what he's talking about there in verse 5. That we will be renewed like the eagle. He would fly. He would soar. He will, even though he might be, he might be old, he might be Worn, he might be weary, he still can soar upward with new strength because of the satisfaction of the Lord. Then David ends Psalm 103 with a celebration. Look what he says in verse 20. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his holy hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. 
Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. David is so enraptured with the Lord that he wants everyone, everywhere, even the angels of heaven, even the starry host, to praise God for his goodness and his graciousness. As a Christian, you belong to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the sovereign God who rules over everything. The, angel, the, the scriptures tell us the angels around the throne praise God. They shout, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They, they affirm the attributes of God. Why not join him in worship that way? This week is Thanksgiving week. Let me give you a quick assignment. I want you to find a way that you can truly Praise God. Now I know some of you are going to stand around with the turkey or whatever is laying out before you and going, well, I praise God for And you're going to say something pretty quickly because you want that chicken leg, okay? You want that turkey leg. Um, don't just make it flippant. Find a real reason that you can truly praise God for. David said, I praise God because of his forgiveness. I praise God because he satisfies me. And I praise God uh, because of his redemption. You can praise God for those same things too, okay? Join me in prayer. God, I thank you so much for your great love and your mercy. I pray, Father, as we celebrate Thanksgiving, we truly can be thankful. Father, because you have forgiven our sin. You have redeemed us from the pit of destruction. And you have satisfied us with the goodness of you. I pray, Father, as we celebrate Thanksgiving, that we'll truly be thankful people. Celebrating you, celebrating what you're doing, and what you will be doing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.